um, it's lovely hearing from Jacob and Toby, um, so I'm honoured to be here. Um, I think it's only right to begin um, at the age of 15. Um, at the age of 15, I was um, unfairly convicted uh, and received a three-year criminal record. Um, and the reason why that happened is we did go to a very racist and Islamophobic uh, area uh, in Liverpool. Um, and what happened, which is interesting for me, that I only understood today at the age of 25, was the privilege of a bystander. Um, and I never really realised it because I thought I was always angry at the bus driver, the one who slayed the racist um, prejudice, um, and I'd confronted him uh, verbally and physically as a 15-year-old teenager. But what was interesting is I'd never seen the perspective of the bystander because it was the bystander who would basically put in the claim against me. It wasn't the bus driver because the bus driver knew what he did was wrong. And for me, 10 years later, after joining the campaign of the Anthony Walker Foundation here in Liverpool, they made me realise that it was actually not my fault. So for 10 years, I've actually blamed myself and was really embarrassed to say I had a criminal record for three years. Um, but the good news is, um, because I thought I had a criminal record for my whole life, I became an artist. Um, I told my mother to buy me a camera at the age of 16. At 17, I received my first commission, and since then, I've not really had a 9-to-5 job. I've been exploring art as a medium. So I'm going to start with this piece um, that I did for the Anthony Walker Foundation, and it's called My School Bus Stop. My school bus stop is hide and seek behind the glass shield. We race to the school gate sucking on sour lollipops with our mouths inked in blue. The attendance officer marks us late. It was a promise we made to the girls to leave no one behind. This playground is war, turned cold, and the hijab tightened itself. I told my mother I need running shoes. She said, what for? I said, I need... I need legs that can run faster. But I carried my heart to the thump of his feet, growing louder on the double-decker stairs. And he stood tall, standing, chanting Beladen headlines and curry smell. And I sat small, hiding behind the Metro newspaper in a story that looked like mine. So I stuck out my foreign tongue. The passengers pulled sad faces, hugging the predator with his fist in my face, and a bystander choked on its privilege, called in the police and I was saved, shackled to the prison gates, and they held my narrative hostage. So I grew a lioness in my scars and juiced me my foreign face and assalamu alaikum to my predators. Um, so I thought it would really, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think it would have been um, only important to start here because it only took me 10 years to say this publicly. Um, so no, it was not my fault. And would I defend myself again? Yes. The only biggest regret that I didn't have was that someone to teach me my rights at the age of 15. Because um, the way I was even checked and um, stripped by police officers, I, I was even told that it was even actually wrong. The way I was mocked in the interview room, I was told that was wrong 10 years later. So the reason I'm here today, even though this took me 10 years, I knew that there was fire in my stomach to bring change, but I just did not know how to do it. And the only way I could have done it is through poetry, because I knew that that's it, I have an audience, I have a stage. But what is, and there's three things that I've realised over 10 years, is the power that I have but also the power that I don't have because sometimes people don't realize that activists are sometimes one people and you know or artists are only one it's only a one person job sometimes and um you know so it's about also looking for allyship because there's certain types of people in our society that have the power and sometimes we don't my poem can't change waves but I know someone else that can maybe be inspired to create new policies and um, also look for an opportunity so i've always said what is it that i can do in this time so something's happened um currently so i look for that opportunity so it's about hijacking our opportunity and finding ways to say well there's an opportunity for me here now how do i use that to benefit 
the story that I'm trying to tell, but also who am I helping or bringing change in this in this process. I'm also looking for potential. It's not about creating art today and it, it's becoming an entertainment piece. I always say to everyone, I'm not here to sing rainbows and clouds. You know, the art that I, I'm trying to, it's not. It comes from pain and it comes from a certain type of struggle that, you know, not my struggle, but sometimes the struggle that you want to bring, but you just can't say it in words or articulate it. So I can happily say that poetry is my little baby, <laughs> but it also saved me. Um, it also saved me from many things. <laughs> um, so uh, as my bio states as a Yemeni Scouser, um, when I went into the poetry uh, stage, I was known as the Muslim writer, which I understand. I am visibly Muslim. Um, do you know what I mean? I'm not a penguin. So and <laughs> what happened was, um, you know, I just thought... You know, I'm not just Muslim, you know, you know, I'm I'm quite passionate. I'm, I can be hilarious if you sit with me over an orange juice and you can have your beer or whatever. But, um, and I just thought, what can I do to change that label? Because at the end of the day, I'm proud of my faith and it, it's a part of me visibly. Uh, so what I did is I, someone came up to me and said, are you that Yemeni Scouse writer? And I've never seen them combinations together. It's like it's like having a chocolate cake with a cheesecake, you know. And I just thought, can they even be together? You know, I never understood that these two identities can be part of one. And I did. I took ownership of that. I changed it on every bio. I even introduced myself. And I was like, I am the Yemeni Scouse. And you know what's interesting? Two years ago, I went to a, a white middle class networking event very successful women across the Northwest. And they even created a hashtag on LinkedIn, Yemeni Scouse, without even me indicating that they should. And that was really powerful for me because it's not about me. It's about visibility. It's about representation. And for me, that was really important because as a Muslim, there's a lot of negative connotations that come with that. And I feel like sometimes that's what delays the process. In, in, in a lot of my Muslim peers that express that they think that they can't explore their art form in a safe space as being Muslim, especially female Muslims. Um, so going on to like talking a bit more about Yemen, um, I came in contact with the campaign against the arms trade when, um, when I realised that my writing and my art is no longer about me and it's about people that I can use my f platform to vocalise their, um, what they want to say, but acknowledging the privilege that I have, uh, but also remembering that not to hijack other people's spaces when, when they are, are able to. And when the war began in Yemen, um, it took me a year to express how I felt about that because I'd already expressed my first poem at the age of 14 about Palestine, and then it went on to the Arab Spring. and then. But when I came to your own home... I think it makes it even more difficult to express that because it's like, and you even start to deny it. I even started to deny it now. It's not happening. It'll blow over. And what's interesting, it's six years now, and I think Campaign Against the Armed Trades and the work that they do with Yemeni activists um, in Yemen is really important work because what, what that did is looking at who has the power. And that's not saying that Yemeni people don't have the power, but we also have to acknowledge that they are being censored in Yemen by both sides, not just by Saudi Arabia, but also the Houthi rebels. They're not allowed to express themselves through artistic practices of their political um, rights. Um, they are being killed. So I, I have told even my friends, don't encourage Yemeni activists on the ground to do what you think that they should do, but also remember that the risk that that will ha the implications that will have on their life. So it's really important to know the ethical boundaries here as well when we're connecting with activists across across the world. Um, and I think for me, um, it's about power shifting the narrative. Um, so going back to the whole Yemeni Scouse, um, for me growing up as you know, as a 25 year old artist, and I'm still learning. I still think that I'm an amateur in in everything. But I think one thing that I have to say is. It's about being brave and taking risks. Um, art, the artistic and creative world is a, is a very lonely place. It really is. 
and um, we might look like we are very brave and courageous and artistic, but we you have to also acknowledge that we're, what we're doing physically, mentally and emotionally is a lot. Because we're taking a lot from, you know, especially activism and art. It's a lot emotionally and physically. And, um, and I just hope that the world, especially in the pandemic, values the artistic world even more. Because as well as it does entertain, it's been your Netflix binge for the past year. There are also artists who are still continuing that conversation behind the pandemic because war has not stopped. People are still going through war and the pandemic. People are still going through, you know, um, certain types of slavery around the world. Um, and there is a pandemic. Um, and I think this is all just a distraction um, as well. So people are taking advantage of that power. Um, but I'm just going to end it with this idea is as an artist and an activist, and I'm going to ask everyone in the audience, what is your purpose? You know, is it to win or is it to be right? And I ask myself every single day when I wake up, why am I here? Am I here because I want to win or is it I want to be right? Or sometimes it's neither. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to finish with the short piece, and this is called Golden Eagle. Sorry, be a cell interpreter. I was dead quick. <laughs> okay, I'm a dark horse. Beating down the door somewhere, my childhood escaped the streets, etching three syllables of my name beneath the old city of Babel, Yemen. And a woman dressed in black found me shackled to the gates. It was my mother chewing on her ruby passport. It's time to leave. And goodbyes past the northern valleys, greeted the southern blue waters, unlocking the fisherman's red sea and the colony crown reeked of death, buried in my foreign blood. And martyrs will meet life and justice will dance on the head to snakes. And it turned cold quickly over the Mediterranean. Because this Yemeni girl sings British anthems between her terrace walls. And I lost a part of me. Because I forgot the taste of my mother's milk with her nipple gritted between my teeth. And I taught my mother how to speak English. Translating her hospital letters because the cold is eating her bones. And is a heartbreak worth to be torn between my two homes if my racist neighbour daydreams our women in two-piece sets, golden headbands and white polished toes in the sand because I deserve my honour. And I lost a part of me in this dining room, learning to use a knife and fork because we don't eat Sunday roast fish and chips, porky pie or go to the pubs because I like my fingers and my food and coffee before I sleep. But I lost a part of me in this corner shop Grandad left selling mocha beans, broken dreams, broken biscuits for half a penny because this Yemeni girl sing British anthems and British bombs between her terrace walls. But she wears home and this dress still fits perfectly. Thank you.